As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have an important returning guest today, Mike Rivero, founder and host of What Really Happened, is here with us. He's on whatreallyhappened.com. He's also on a radio channel he'll tell us about, and he's been with us here to field viewers' questions in the past, and that's what he's going to be hitting again tonight. Mike, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you for having me again. We have a variety of topics that our viewers have submitted, and they may trigger other follow-ups on my part, but if we could start with those as an outline and uh, let you take a crack at some of these. Okay. Uh, the first one is talking about our economic system and talking about, as Jason Curl uh, submitted this question, he says, we all know that the current system is going to fail because all Ponzi schemes eventually do. But how do we reconcile a system where real tangible assets like mortgage-backed securities, homes, have been acquired through the creation of new currency that never existed? How do you see this playing out? Well, uh, basically, it is a pyramid scam, and uh, we're basically dealing with fairy tale money that has absolutely no backing in a fixed commodity. In fact, if you really think about it, the only thing backing the U.S. Federal Reserve note and the Treasury bond is the future slave labor of the American people. Uh, ultimately, it has to collapse because uh, private central banking is inherently an unstable system because by design it creates more debt than money with which to pay the debt until the debt swamps the system and brings it down. And uh, the next topic is from Bond Fan Man, again, in the uh, economic realm. How long do you think it's going to take for the Chinese slash Russian slash Indians to drain the West's reserves of remaining, quote, cheap gold? When that time arrives, can't China, with presumably the largest stockpile of gold in the world, then unilaterally declare the value of gold at a much higher price? And can it then partly back the yuan as a gold reserve currency and also have the means to settle any financial problems it may have by printing more money as required? So it's kind of a lot of questions thrown together there. Yeah, it is. It's a complex question here. Now, Russia and China are already talking about uh, trade between their countries based on a gold-backed currency. And what complicates the uh, gold basis for any currency uh, is the rigging of the gold prices through the printing, overprinting, of these gold futures contracts. Because the way the London gold fix is calculated is they're blending the current demand price for the physical metal with the value of all these paper contracts process, uh, promising gold to be delivered in the future. But those are being overprinted, and there's already over a trillion dollars exposure in these gold future contracts. And the, right now, the contracts that are coming due are being settled for the cash equivalent of the gold value plus a premium for being willing to take the cash. But at some point, as the value of the cash begins to decline rapidly, the holders of those contracts are going to demand the contracts be honored uh, in the physical gold that was contracted for, and we're going to see a gold run on all these centers. And at that, pri at that point, the price of gold is going to go right through the roof. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, the, China's acquisition of gold, Russia's acquisition of gold, right. puts them in a stronger and stronger position of being able to set the price of gold for the entire world, taking that away from the London gold fixed. And uh, a related uh, topic here for the London Gold Exchange, it says, this is from Brother Joseph, any insight on the LBMA's withdrawal and what will be the future of the metals manipulations market due to their exit? Will anyone be willing to pick up the ball on January 1st of 2018 with the silver market having had 10 trillion in paper manipulations last year, up from 6.5 trillion in 2015, a 40 plus percent increase in just a year? How much is too much for them and will they ever just throw in the towel? <laughs> Well, I, I, I think they won't throw in the towel because so far the fraud has worked and the people who are trading in these paper contracts uh, are still operating in the belief that uh, this is actually a solution uh, to uh, the, the metals market. Uh, but I think there's going to be a shock awakening uh, again at some point as the value of the paper currencies starts to really erode rapidly. We're going to see the holders of these silver and gold contracts demand the contracts be settled in the contracted for delivery of physical metal. 
and all the uh, added premiums are not going to deter them. And at that point, we're going to see a real panic. And uh, the, uh, uh, the attempt to control gold and silver prices uh, is going to start to break down. And people are going to start emptying those negative interest rate savings accounts and liquidating their stock portfolios uh, to get into uh, the safe haven of the physical metals. And uh, we have a switch. Uh, this is also a related topic, and you pretty much just covered this, I think, is from Woodworks 1423. What will it take for the COMEX to blow up? I guess that gets back to your, your discussion of people demanding delivery in physical rather than in cash settlements. Yeah, that, that basically is, is what's going to happen here. Uh, and again, the people who are in those paper markets, uh, they want to believe that the paper really represents something of value and that somewhere down the line they're going to get the physical gold. Uh, but uh, uh, again, it is a self-defeating system because the more they try and suppress uh, the gold and silver prices, the more obvious it's becoming, and the holders of those contracts are starting to get very, very nervous. And at some point, they are going to start demanding the contracts be settled in the physical metal because that, after all, is what they contracted for. And uh, this practice of settling for the cash equivalent uh, of the metals plus a premium is going to fall apart when the decline of uh, the cash uh, overwhelms the cash premium premium in terms of long-term value. And they're going to start demanding that metal. And there isn't enough to satisfy all those contracts. There's at least a trillion dollars in paper gold contracts out there for which there is no gold to satisfy them. That's something that's been brought up uh, by multiple vi visitors here. We've had Rob Kirby from Kirby Analytics. We've had Bill Murphy from uh, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee and others talking yes. about these, um, the almost unlimited amounts of uh, f uh, futures that have been shorted against, the paper futures that have been shorted against physical gold. And uh, it seems, this is always bewildering to me because from having you know dabbled in options trading with stocks or whatever, if you put out a naked short position like that, uh, you know, or sell puts, naked puts like that, you're basically on the hook to, to uh, pay up if the if the price spikes against you, if there's if there's a uh, you know a rush to 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 uh, buy that or to people people covering, uh, you can really get caught uh, on a very negative, uh, hard to unwind that position without huge losses, um, and it just seems like it's been going on for years and years. But some people have talked about them opportunistically finding thinly traded times to to make their attacks and then go ahead and and turning profits on a regular basis along the way. So it's not clear to me whether they're just continuing to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate a basically a liability uh, that will finally blow up, or if they're just uh, working that in a, in a whipsaw manner so that they always can knock it down when the trading is thin and then, and then go ahead and recoup uh, a profitable you know, cover when, when the volume returns. I, that's one thing that's not been clear to me. Well, first of all, naked shorting is illegal in most countries. Uh, and the, the idea uh, uh, of uh, depressing gold and silver prices, uh, it's not being done with an idea that you're going to recoup your losses down the road. Uh, the goal of suppressing metals prices is to discourage ordinary investors from leaving the stock market, leaving the paper equities, leaving uh, their savings accounts, and getting into the metals. Because if you invest in metals and you have them in your possession under your control, mm -hmm. then the bankers do not have that asset with which to try and balance their books and play their little financial games. And uh, it is uh, uh, an act of desperation. Uh, for, these, for these institutions to do this, uh, and uh, it's a holding action, but it's not going to last forever. And uh, it's clear we're headed to a, a crash and a crisis moment. Uh, the only question is when it's going to happen, and trying to predict when that's going to happen is complicated by the fact that everybody who's out here prognosticating the collapse of the economic system is doing so on the basis of of the rules that are in place on the economic system, but we're dealing with the government and we're dealing with the financial sector that feels free to change the rules yeah. on the fly uh, to, to basically try and maintain the system for a little while longer. So it, it complicates the issue. But in the end, uh, we have a lot of people who are basically promising to sell assets they don't actually have, and that has to reach a breaking point. Right. If we could turn our attention now to geopolitics and taxes, we've got three uh, questions in that category. 
The first one comes from Paul Eberhardt and Yasvana Sandoval. Does Mike still support Trump? No. Uh, I, I'm willing to admit I'm very, very disappointed in Donald Trump. That being said, my campaign last year was more about keeping Hillary Clinton out of the White House than putting Donald Trump in. Uh, but like a lot of people, we were uh, sort of hoping that by getting Trump into the White House and getting Hillary out, that we would derail this rush to a new world war. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, Donald Trump has been co-opted by the American oligarchs and the political system, and he's now fully on board with the neocon war agenda. And that, of course, is of concern to all of us, uh, especially those of us who like live in Hawaii within range of yeah. Russia and China and North Korea's missiles, but mostly because that uh, in our current state of economic decline uh, and the poor quality of modern American weapon systems, uh, it looks like the United States is probably going to lose this next world war. There's so many uh, scenarios uh, that are that are being discussed there. We're going to have a guest uh, later this week, um, Dr. Arthur T. Bradley. He's a widely uh, read author on survival uh, and survivalism, and he's mm -hmm. going to talk about a number of different scenarios that could potentially launch World War III just from all of this um, uh, activity we've been seeing around the world. And that gets into another uh, question for you from On Go Where To, which is, where are the regions where you see the most trouble within the next 10 years, <laughs> maybe the next 10 well, months. <laughs> how much time do we have? Because there are so many of them. We're hearing that Ukraine may launch an offensive against the Donbass, which is a flashpoint for war with Russia. Uh, we are now aware that the USS Vincennes is, in fact, now headed toward North Korea. And there is a concern that the United States may take the aircraft, uh, aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan which was contaminated during the Fukushima disaster, they may sail that up to North Korea because it really is not usable anymore uh, and blow it up and blame North Korea for that and make our radioactive waste disposal problem North Korea's waste disposal problem. Uh, but it, it just seems that there are so many open sores, if you will, for the Warhawks to uh, uh, exploit uh, to try and get the war going. Now, uh, it looked like for a while the U.S. maybe had blinked on North Korea, but again, they're ratcheting up the rhetoric on that. Uh, they're still out there with this uh, situation in Syria, uh, trying to claim that Assad gassed his own people, even though nobody can come up with a reason why Assad would have done something that stupid right. when he's on the verge of a diplomatic victory that would allow his continuance as president of Syria. Uh, and ultimately, the final trump card, if you will, uh, is going to be a false flag attack of some kind where something will be blown up in a spectacular fashion and will be off and running into this new world war. And my concern about the new world war is twofold. One, uh, that nuclear weapons will be used. And two, that the United States uh, is probably going to lose this one because we don't have the money, the manufacturing or the manpower uh, to successfully conduct a war against Russia and China. And if you go back to The Art of War by Sun Tzu, uh, in the very first chapter, he lists out all the things a ruler must have to succeed in war, one of which is a military that believes in the moral rightness of the war so that they will fight fiercely and, if necessary, die in that war. And you have to have a civilian population that believes in the moral rightness of the war so that they will bear the burdens that war brings even to the victorious side. And the U.S. government does not have either one of those. And that's why the continuance of this war policy is extraordinarily reckless. But unfortunately, uh, the conventional wisdom within the neocon war machine is that without a new world war, the U.S. economy will implode because more and more nations are abandoning the use of the U.S. dollar for global trade and banking. And the... Uh, loaning of those dollars at interest and the trading of those dollars for manufactured goods and agricultural produce is uh, almost all that's still holding up what remains of the U.S. economy. Then the, uh, turning the attention to uh, domestic taxation, Jason Curl asks, what are your thoughts on a consumption tax while eliminating the federal income tax? We could also tie a rate to Social Security inputs so that people who have paid into the system longer don't get screwed in the reset. Isn't this the fairest way of all? 
Well, it is a fairer way than what we have right now, where the tax burden is placed on the poor and middle class, and the ultra-rich are getting all these loopholes. A consumption tax would balance that by shifting the tax burden back onto the wealthy, which is why they're fighting it tooth and nail. But ultimately, you need to go back and realize that for the uh, first hundred years of the United States, there was no personal income tax. In fact, it was forbidden in the original Constitution, and the United States did just fine. Then in 1913, we got saddled with a private central bank, the very sort of bank uh, tyranny that we fought the revolution to break free of. Right. And in the very same year, they passed uh, the 16th Amendment, which may not actually have succeeded in being ratified, that is used as justifying an income tax on ordinary Americans. And so we find ourselves today back in the same situation of economic predation that the American colonials were in 1776. That's right. And um, the next, uh, turning our attention to survivalism and controversies, we have a question from Kimbo Slice. What would you put in a Faraday cage to best recover from an EMP? Well, um, first of all, you need to understand an EMP attack uh, is only going to be effective against anything that's plugged into a large-scale power distribution system because it is that magnetic pulse interacting with very long, high transmission lines uh, that creates a dangerous overvoltage. Uh, uh, items that are on battery power or disconnected from the wall power are pretty much immune to EMP. But obviously, whatever your personal records are going to be need to go into the Faraday cage uh, uh, to be protected. Uh, and possibly have uh, an extra standby computer uh, that is air-gapped, that is in that Faraday cage, so that afterwards you can, in fact, try and connect back to the Internet if the Internet is still up and running. When you talked about documents being in there, I assume you meant in some sort of like a jump drive or some kind of storage, uh, electronic storage? Yeah, very much so. Uh, flash drives uh, are, are immune to EMP if they're not plugged into a computer, and they're turning out to be much more durable and long-lasting than media such as CD-ROMs uh, and certainly magnetic media, which has a lifespan of maybe five years. And the cheaper brands of CD-ROMs actually lose their data after only two or three. So uh, flash drive media seems to last a very, very long time, whether it's your personal records or the records of current events. Uh, that really is the way to go. So this turns now to controversial subjects. Robert Buffalo asks, what is going on in Antarctica? Um, I'm not sure what the context of that question is. I think there's a couple uh, different ones, and we could maybe look at them separately. Uh, one is uh, this ac accusation by uh, Al Gore and others for the past decade that global warming is going to cause the Antarctic ice, ice shelf to slide into the ocean and raise the oceans by 20 feet and drown Florida and that sort of thing. The other is a sequence of uh, claims over the past few months that some notable dignitaries, perhaps members of Clinton's or other uh, high political ranking people have been seen making trips to Antarctica uh, unexplainable why these you know high ranking either government or or financial people have been making trips to Antarctica so I'm not I'm not up on it but thought maybe you could uh, uh, field either one of those well first of all you need to understand that large ice masses whether it's Antarctica or Greenland uh, they're always sloughing off chunks of ice into the ocean. And it doesn't mean the world is warming and the oceans are rising, because in the interior of Antarctica and Iceland, uh, you have new snow, new rain falling, glaciating, uh, and it's replacing the ice as rapidly as it breaks off uh, into the uh, ocean. Now, as far as all these dignitaries visiting Antarctica, I, I don't know how many are actually confirmed, uh, it could very well be just a sense of wanting to go someplace uh, that is that interesting uh, because uh, it is Antarctica, it's unreachable, and it's almost a status symbol to say that you've been there. I remember when I was working uh, in Australia, there was a travel agency where all they did was arrange tours to Antarctica, and some of them uh, amounted to no more than uh, sailing up to Antarctica in a ship walking on the ice for a few hours and then sailing right back. Another one was simply an aircraft flight that went over the Antarctic ice sheet and came home, just so you could say you'd been to Antarctica. 
and, and, and so I know there's a lot of research going on in Antarctica. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest about Lake Vostok possibly holding uh, almost uh, unknown forms of life because it's been buried under the ice for so long. Uh, but it is a very, very interesting place. Next question is from Brian Hecht. Knowing your early career was covertly impacted by the death of Vince Foster and the Clinton Crime Syndicate, is there any truth to the following story? And it goes on to say that uh, Vince Foss, Foster's body was exhumed, but the, it looked like the, the concrete vault had been tampered with and had to be replaced. Two bullet holes in the skull indicates homicide rather than suicide. And then when they took the vault out, they made a horrible discovery. A body wrapped in an old tarp had been buried underneath Foster's vault. The body was removed, sent to the Naval Hospital in Norfolk, where it was identified as Margaret Sangua. As it turns out, worked as the White House intern from 1993 until her disappearance. So the question is, is there any truth to the following story, that story? Um, I seriously doubt it. There are a lot of websites that have been created lately that do nothing but put out bogus stories in an attempt to discredit the independent media. And in the case of the story about Vince Foster being exhumed, the giveaway was the claim that he was exhumed from a graveyard in Virginia when, in fact, Vincent Foster was buried back in his hometown of Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, there's another one of the same ilk that's out there saying that true, two of Trey Gowdy's investigators have mysteriously disappeared. So we need to be very, very careful because right now there is literally a war going on between the government and corporate media and the independent media. And the government and corporate media can't start telling the truth all they can try and do is uh, poison the well of the independent media by putting out nonsense, bogus stories that are easy to discredit and hoping that various websites will pick them up. Next question on controversies from Ian Trilloir. When I've listened to you on Reluctant Preppers, I've been impressed at the quality of your observations and find them very insightful. But visiting your website, I see many articles attacking Christianity. I accept that you don't believe the Bible and dislike it for everyone that has that freedom to choose that way. But why do you feel you must attack and mock and attack our faith with such venom? This troubles me because I believe there are reasonable answers to the faults you find in the Bible, but it seems to me that you have chosen to rely on the opinions of critics who hate our faith without examining the reasonable explanations to the assumed faults and contradictions. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not attacking Christianity. The articles that I put up are about the problem with clerical sexual abuse. And that's a legitimate concern, mm -hmm. uh, and as long as the church refuses to deal with this problem themselves, uh, I'm going to continue to make an issue about it, because uh, uh, I'm very kind of open about you know, people's behavior uh, when it uh, involves consenting adults. Uh, but when it comes to the abuse of children, right. some very primal instincts kick in, and I'm not at all ashamed about it. Uh, and as long as these priests continue to molest and abuse these children, I'm going to continue to put focus on it. The, the, uh, I completely understand that absolute uh, indignation and, and rage at the, um, any exploitation or abuse of innocent, especially children, this, the, lot, the, the stealing of anyone's innocence. Uh, some statistics I had seen uh, over the past several years were comparing incidents of both accusations and verifications of of. Uh, abuse of minors uh, by either members of the Catholic clergy, which was approximately half a percent had been accused, versus up to 10, uh, 10, 1 to 10 percent of uh, other clergy or even public school teachers. So do you, this is a question following up, would, would you say that the uh, scandal, uh, which has over the past decade been significantly addressed by the, the Catholic Church, uh, is being equally addressed and and publicizing the media by what's happening in, for example, public schools and elsewhere. Well, we ran an article on what really happened dot com today, uh, actually yesterday, talking about how Texas is now investigating uh, cases of educators, teachers having inappropriate sexual relations with their students. Right. So we're uh, we're not just picking on the Catholics in this case. Uh, and, and, and frankly, we're looking at all these stories like the Franklin scandal, uh, which went all the way up to the Bush White House. Uh, we talk about the scandal at the BBC, where some of their media stars were engaging in this kind of behavior, uh, because regardless of who is doing it, uh, it is aberrant behavior. 
uh, I refuse to say uh, that or see that it is somehow, you know, just a variation and normal. And we're seeing that people who are involved in sexual abuse of children is saying, well, it's just another variation like being gay or bi or anything. And I disagree with that because being gay or bi, you're dealing with consenting adults. When you're talking about children, you're dealing with a class of victims who are, in most cases, too young to understand what sexuality is about to begin with. And becoming uh, aware, growing up, losing your innocence, it is a one-way street. So when an adult uh, sexually molests a small child, it's more than just a sexual crime. You're stealing away their youth, and there's no way they can get it back. It's like when you find out... Uh, there is really no Santa Claus. You can't go back to believing. And so uh, in, in my view, it's a very, very horrible crime for anybody to do this, right. whether it's clergy, politicians, Jeff Epstein on his little island in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it, 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 is, it is a terrible, terrible thing. And maybe part of my passion, if you will, on this subject is because I'm a frustrated daddy. Uh, I wanted to be a father growing up. I wanted to have children in my own family. Circumstances basically led to my never being able to have that joy. Uh, But my wife and I uh, are probably the world's best auntie and uncle uh, to other families who have children. Mm -hmm. And we love to spoil them rotten, teach them science, and, and just encourage them along whatever path they are displaying, whether it's art, music, science, and whatever. Because in my mind, that is how adults are supposed to treat children. You encourage, you nurture. Uh, and for those other people who think that children should be a sexual plaything, I have no tolerance for them whatsoever. And I am not ashamed to say that. Next one is about fake news and independent media. Do you believe that the corporate media are engaged in a concerted program to discredit and undermine independent media? And what do you think independent media, bro- independent broadcasters can do to preserve their voice? Well, there's absolutely no question that both the corporate media and the government are attacking independent media. Uh, we're hearing the former uh, head of the Federal Election Commission is calling for regulation on political speech online meaning the independent media, uh, as far as what we can do about it, uh, the independent media, just keep on doing what you're doing. Tell the truth. Get the facts out there. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, we're seeing the corporate media, uh, like Facebook, they're adding buttons. You know, if, if this is fake news, you can push the button and you can mark it as such. Uh, what we need is that same button on the corporate <laughs> media itself and on our politicians. Yeah, yeah. you mentioned in a recent podcast, uh, or actually on your radio channel earlier this week, that uh, you can pretty well count on when the United States comes out announcing uh, some big uh, uh, accusation against some foreign government that there's going to be a boom coming in the, in the near future against that country. Absolutely. I mean, false flags are, are fact of life. And the reality is, if you look at history, every single war is launched by a ruler who has to trick their population into it. Torpedoes in the Gulf of Tonkin, Spanish mine in Havana Harbor, Saddam's nuclear weapons, Assad's sarin gas, on and on and on and on. And uh, fortunately, though, it does look like the people of the world are waking up to this reality that governments lie to them not once, not twice, not occasionally, but all the time. And that is a very healthy trend. And uh, any other topics that uh, this is the end of our viewers' questions, and we'd just like to give you one last chance to uh, add any uh, further point that you'd like for people who are specifically concerned about self-reliance, independence, and awareness uh, before we uh, wrap tonight. Well, regardless of whether the U.S. suffers a major economic crash uh, or we get into a world war that we're probably going to lose, you can count on the corporate supply chains to collapse. And right now is the time to start uh, building the capability to take care of yourself and your loved ones on your own away from those supply chains that we have been encouraged to be dependent on. The other thing I want to mention is when you are being told something by the corporate media and the government, you have to stop and think about it. Don't let your emotions decide what you're going to do. 
Don't let your beliefs tell you what you're going to do. Stop and think. And, I, and, and a good example, of course, is this claim that Assad gassed his own people uh, back on April 4th. Because if you really think about it, he had absolutely no reason to do that. Uh, he's got no motive. And you don't have a crime without a motive. And, and the more you think rather than feel about what you're being told, uh, the harder it's going to be for the government to deceive you into doing something you really don't want to do. That uh, point has been raised by other guests of ours who have really stressed that the very practice of rational thought, um, uh, committing to uh, reflection on uh, reality check, uh, cross you know, checking in the facts, and not just going with the emotion that's stirred up by the shallow skimming that that's become the norm of headlines really is a, is critical going forward to f prevent us from falling into the trap of just being anesthetized by the propaganda that's of whatever we're being uh, conditioned to believe before before you know actions are taken by by the powers that be and that it it's going to take a lot of individual choices to to be self-disciplined in not uh, surrendering our obligation and our ability to do uh, critical thinking about things, but that in especially in the in the upcoming generation, uh, it's really not being taught in school. It, it's being a lost art. Is is this idea of of critical thinking and really looking at real uh, consequences and and making logical you know extrapolations like that? So, are there any uh, tips you have for people on how to how to um, both gather? information that's going to be uh, more uh, multi-sided than what they're going to get just from corporate media and also how to apply that kind of uh, critical thinking that you're describing well it really is very simple we know we were lied to about torpedoes in the gulf of tonkin we were lied to about a spanish mine in havana harbor we were lied about the Lusitania not smuggling weapons to Great Britain. We were lied about Pearl Harbor being a complete surprise. We were lied to about Saddam's nukes. We were lied to about Assad's sarin gas. So at this point, the wise and prudent course of action is to assume up front, a priori, that anything coming out of the government and the corporate media is just another lie and to proceed on that until the government and the corporate media can prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that this time, for once, in all of history, they're telling you the truth. Yeah. Now, as far as resources, uh, very obviously, if you sit back in your chair and you let the TV feed you what they want you to think, you will think what the TV wants you to think. Uh, being informed, knowing the truth, uh, is a very active occupation. You have to work at it. You have to go on out there, look at the various websites, look at a diversity of opinion, and make up your own mind. I'm not asking anybody to believe what is it, what really happened.com or what I broadcast on Republic Broadcasting. I don't want you to believe at all, okay? Because I can make mistakes and I can be misled. What I want is for people to re rely on them, their own analytical abilities to go on out and find the facts for themselves and make up their own mind. And I have every confidence that the American people as a whole have the ability to go on out and realize when they're being lied to and when they're being used. And if everybody just makes that effort to go on out and get that information, get the facts, get the truth, and think about it themselves, uh, that they're going to come to the right conclusion. And we're going to be able to stop this march toward World War III on the basis of lies, fraud, and deception. Following up on that idea about suppression of the independent voice of broadcasters, we've had a number of guests on our show who say that the, their voice is being demonetized. We've had uh, uh, Sean Turnbull from the SGT Report say that his not only his videos individually are being demonetized, but his entire channel, therefore, and others uh, who have had to resort to other means of trying to replace the pressure that would otherwise drive them completely off the air because they their their entire uh, monetization model their their funding for their independent media is is being uh, choked off. Can you offer any uh, words of wisdom to those who who see that their you know their their income is being just choked off uh, and what they can do to keep their voice alive? Well, as I said before, there's actually a war going on between the corporate media and the independent media, and the other side loves to play dirty. In fact, they believe it's their divine right to play dirty, and cutting off our advertiser revenue is one way that they like to do it. 
And the way we can defeat this is for the listeners and audience, readers of the websites and the radio shows, is to step up and make a donation because the only way we're going to be able to get rid of the big money influence uh, over information flow in this country is for the little money to unite together in service to the truth. Well, Mike Rivero, host of WhatReallyHappened.com, thank you so much once again for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you very much for having me.